Um, I'm continually amazed by the power of technology, and um, thanks so much for making me a part of this, even as a floating head. <laughs> uh, I'm here to talk about a research project that I've been working on for a couple of years related to graffiti, street art, and advertisers. And um, this project really looks at the interplay between graffiti and advertising practice, particularly today in um, major urban areas. I focus on New York, but it's a thing that's happening in several different places around the country. Um, in order to talk about this, we can go back and, and talk a little bit about the history of graffiti. Um, so graffiti, of course, has been around for millennia. The kind that I want to talk about today is the graffiti that started in the 1960s. Uh, it started in Philadelphia, and not New York, um, with a writer named Cornbread. And uh, this is really coming out of the, um, the white flight and affliction of um, urban areas in the 1960s um, that young writers are starting to put their names up on walls. It's also very much related to some technological advancements Aerosol paint is invented in 1949, and uh, that makes it possible to be much more competitive with advertisements in terms of how much you can actually cover in, in the square footage of the city. Um, so in the 1960s, there are a lot of writers writing weird phrases like bird lives after the death of Charlie Parker or cornbread in Philadelphia. That very quickly evolves into a standard template where you have uh, one's real or chosen name and their street number as the basic form of graffiti writing. And uh, the original writers, especially in New York City, are very often low and middle class men of color. And in some ways they're responding to the advertising they see around them in the city. Um, also, when you hear interviews with them that were conducted at the time, they're very much talking about fame and uh, name brand recognition of, of the sort that brands were getting. And this is actually no accident uh, the Mad Men era extended a lot of billboard advertising into low-income neighborhoods. Um, and in some ways, that primed the pump for graffiti writers who were using, in some cases, the same lettering styles, the same fluorescent colors, um, and even some of the same characters, especially cartoon characters mm. from advertisements and, and uh, spokespeople. Um, there's an early innovator called Stay High 149 who uh, really makes use of the same style as branding, um, and he uses a lockup that's very similar to all of the luxury brands that we see today. He has his name, Stay High. Stay High is, is really using this kind of uh, typical lockup from advertising where he has his name, he has a, a mark, which is in this case an angel smoking a marijuana cigarette, and the location, which is 149th Street. Um, so in that sense, it's very similar to Ralph Lauren's polo player, to the Lacoste Alligator, to Yves Saint Laurent. Um, it's, it's using the same style. And we see this fluid interchange between advertising and graffiti happening again. Uh, in the initial instance, it's actually kind of coming from the advertising world and being deposited in the world of graffiti. In uh, 20 years later, you'll see it going the other way around. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things about uh, this, this advertising graffiti pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, if we keep on going in the slideshow, uh, you'll see that some of the early uh, kind of clumsy work of graffiti writers was very much based on tools they could find in stores. They're, um, they're using kind of commercial grade paint and regular markers, and they start to really innovate in terms of making the tools that they use to write with. Um, and what's ironic is that those tools are now actually used, um, that they've become granted in of themselves. Uh, one quick kind of stopping point is the Norman Mailer article from uh, 1974, The Faith of Graffiti, uh, which is one of the first um, places where it receives national attention. And uh, it's receiving attention very much, um, I mean, for many people in New York City, this is the breaking of a social contract. Um, it symbolizes all that has kind of gone haywire in their city. Um, if you keep on going, you'll see some of the, the uh, images that illustrate the article. Um, and we can actually skip over Mailer's text. It's, uh, I'm, I'm personally not a fan, but I think it's a, great, um, it's a great entry point into graffiti for the rest of the country. And, um, as graffiti is derided by people in places of authority, 
it's still kind of lionized in the cultural scene, Wild Style, and other movies are featuring younger graffiti writers like Lee Quijones, who's um, becoming sort of a, a bandit-like star. He has this uh, outsider sex appeal, James Dean thing going on. Um, and then also academics are taking notice. So Craig Castleman's Getting Up is one of the first books to really chart the subway graffiti writers. Um, at this time, uh, as graffiti is entering the subways, it's becoming more dangerous. It's also becoming more male. Uh, it, the women who are involved in the early days are breaking off as it goes into the yards. It's also becoming more collaborative. So crews of writers are working together to um, paint trains in teams because it takes more than one set of hands to actually cover a, a New York City subway car. Um, and the hostilities between the authorities and the graffiti writers are becoming more pitched. So um, Ed Koch, the mayor of New York in the 1980s, famously said that uh, if it were up to him, he would put not dogs, but wolves to guard the city's train yards. Very much locates uh, graffiti as something that is, is going to be uh, dangerous for New York as a competitor in the neoliberal um, market of cities. Uh, and, um, and actually, Koch is able, if we continue with the slides, um, he's able to eliminate graffiti on the subway trains by using acid mixtures and very, very intense policing to get graffiti writers out of the subway yards. Um, and we can just keep on going down. There's, from here, it actually, it's just a more of a, a flavor of the 90s era when um, graffiti is sort of leaving the subways, leaving the public realm in that sense, but it's gaining a lot more traction in the fields of art and uh, design. Keith Haring, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat are celebrated art stars who command huge prices for their work, but actually start on the streets as graffiti writers. Hmm. And, um, and actually, one of the interesting things is that as graffiti d disappears from the public realm, uh, it is something that is actually drawing people in its style to the gritty vibrancy of New York City. And this is very much in keeping with marketing New York as a creative class city where um, anything can happen. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit off beat sometimes, it's very freewheeling, and graffiti starts to symbolize something else, not to break down society, but a new kind of urban cool. Um, and when that happens, you see two things. One, you see a lot of people with an uh, art background, what Howard Becker calls integrated art professionals, becoming interested in graffiti as a style. It's also uh, tied up with other subcultures, notably hip hop subcultures, but also skateboarding and uh, punk rock. And, um, and the integrated professionals are, in a sense, the very first street artists who are coming into graffiti uh, with an art world education, with a knowledge of how to position their works, and they're making street artworks not on the subways, but in very specific locations in these urban locales that are known for their cool, like Williamsburg and Brooklyn, like the Mission in San Francisco, and many other neighborhoods that you um, may know, the kind of place where you can get a flat white coffee. Um, and those are the places where street art is really jumping off. And one person we can actually stop on here is Stephen Powers, who uh, was a resuscitated street artist who came from um, the world of illegality. He was a graffiti artist. He was actually jailed for his graffiti work. He became a street artist and is actually now doing uh, works for the mural arts uh, um, in Philadelphia. And he's also doing a lot of corporate commissions. He does, um, you know, these kind of large, very, very uh, graphic, typographic uh, murals for the break rooms that we work uh, for giant advertising firms like Ogilvy. And, uh, and he's really come out of that graffiti world and into the artistic practitioner world of street art. Um, and I know that I'm running out of time here. If we can keep on going to a couple more slides. I'm sorry if I'm this visual bombardment is, is too much. Um, moving into the aughts, you see a lot more of these street artists like Banksy and others, um, Space Invader, and many more who are using interesting tactics to get their work up, whether it's projecting light or soldering them onto buildings or making them with tiles. Um, and advertisers are very much taking notice of that too. So a lot of advertisers in the early 2000s established what are called street teams, and that's a sort of see no evil, hear no evil way to get 
the brand out there. Um, what getting the brand out there means is left uh, very, very uh, fuzzy on purpose, and that's because what often happens is that street teams who employ many former graffiti writers are going out and they're doing wheat paste posters, they're doing stencils, they're doing light projections for a company that has no actual knowledge of these things because they're in fact illegal. So there's this very interesting tightrope between legality and illegality that's walked by uh, major companies that want to get their brand out in a novel way. And sometimes that backfires. In 2007, there was a big to-do about an advertisement for the Cartoon Network that was a glowing LED light but was unfortunately fastened to the bottom of a bridge in Boston and um, anti-terrorism uh, agents swooped in to destroy it and later found out that it was a part of this kind of uh, massive advertising campaign using new techniques. Um, one note I wanted to leave you on is this idea of public space branding and graffiti as a style but also as a tactic. And um, this is Five Points in Queens that was recently torn down. And if we go next to the next slide, um, you'll see that it was uh, ah. resuscitated as a condo building. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that condo building is branded with the graffiti of Five Points, which was a free space for a graffiti artist that was running for about 25 years before it was destroyed. So in this sense, it's come very much full circle um, there are also, and if we keep on going a little bit past uh, some of the examples of new advertising techniques, stencils, and other things, um, and here's that uh, that advertisement um, for uh, for the Comedy Central show that had such a big. If you go to the next slide, um, that was so um, offensive to the Boston Police Department. That's the removal by a SWAT team member. Um, one thing that I wanted to end on is, is uh, if we go to one more, a new program called Link NYC. And Link NYC is a program started by the city uh, to provide free wireless on all the streets around New York. But in doing that, it actually creates many, many new illuminated display areas for advertisement. Um, and I'm very interested as a producer of visual noise and uh, a new kind of flavor in the mix of the palimpsestic quality of, of New York's visual space. So this is a, a, a new space for advertisers. Um, and it's hard to say whether it's normatively good or bad. It's certainly different. Um, but I like to challenge the cut and dry of what is good and bad in the visual space. And um, I think that the trade-offs that Link NYC presents are interesting ones when it comes to uh, ideas of who owns visual space and what type of corporate branding or advertising we see as desirable or possible in the cities that we live in. So I thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, and I hope that I've kept it somewhat on, on time yeah. with uh, yeah. not too many images bombarding you. Thank you, Sam.